Okay, so this is uh, uh, on on the topic of learning lessons from um, we've heard lessons from from India, from uh, Singapore, from Africa, from from Bharat. Um, <clears throat> Our next speaker, uh, Michael Salman, is going to share lessons globally. But also, I, I guess, Michael, you have a, a very distinct um, uh, experience of the of the European uh, banking system and how that's evolving. And, uh, and I'm sure we can learn a lot of lessons from from that. So well, welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I hope you can uh, see my slides. And uh, yes, thank you for perfect. That comes up great. So uh, thanks for inviting me as a no longer incredibly technical person. I did once study computer science 100 years ago, and I actually worked for IBM for many years. But now I'm actually more interested in how to make technology change business and what the consequences of technology are. And the topic uh, I've been asked to, to talk about is uh, open banking, where, of course, uh, Europe, I think, has led the way in enforcing all banks to put an API on top of them and uh, allow third parties to connect to the data and initiate payments. And so I'd like to share with you some of the experience of what, what we've been seeing in Europe uh, on open banking and uh, what APIs can be made to do. Um, I dare to stand in front of you here because I've been working on PSD2 and open banking since its inception, also work with a number of regulators on that, uh, not only in Europe, but across uh, all parts of the world. So I'd like to share some of the best use cases, basically, that, that we've been seeing. Well, the first thing is that open banking is still in development, but it's obviously going to be huge, right? Uh, this topic, which was maybe initially driven by Europe, is no longer a global phenomenon. It's all, it's all over the world. Billions are being invested in it. Thousands of TPPs, as they're called, these third parties that can connect to banks and are seeking licenses. Uh, some individual banks even have thousands of them on their own and uh, an amazing explosion of the use of APIs is, uh, is, is one of the monitors so that, that proves this is happening. Initially, the banks were maybe a little bit reticent, saying this is something, why, why do we want to let others have access to our crown jewels, the, the customer data? But now increasingly, if you can see the, the charts on the left, the banks are seeing this as an opportunity, and uh, uh, the majority even now going into this topic aggressively. So what does it mean? I mean, everybody knows that the open banking and the APIs allows you to do account aggregation. So I can see in one place uh, how much I have in all my bank accounts, what my net worth is, uh, all those useful things. But that's really an old model. That's been uh, in America and in Germany for about 20 years, right? It's been used to, with screen scraping, with other, other technologies. But the way uh, people like Yodli and, and others have been integrating uh, uh, financial data for years. So that's not so, so new. Well, what is maybe newer is in, in the interpretation of the data. Uh, and I don't know what your bank is like, but uh, the, on the left is uh, is what my German bank uh, shows me when I when I invoke a statement when I want to see what what purchases I've done on my account. And as you can see, it's covered with absolute garbage. It's just full of hexadecimal transaction codes, which nobody has has any idea of de decoding. And if it weren't for the amount, I would I would have absolutely no idea of who I'm paying for what. Uh, my British bank has actually gone to the other extreme, that's on the right, and it just shows me I paid for £3.90 for something on the 28th of September. So between those two, I don't think they're doing an incredible job, and of course fintechs who will interpret this data in a much more intelligent way will provide a much, more, much better user interface. So uh, the, the data will not only be displayed in a more structured, graphical, interpretable way, but it can also be used to analyze the customer's uh, behavior. And that's, of course, where the fun starts. And that's where there are these thousands of fintechs are now happening to do better insurance, better loans, better everything. And I'll, I'd like to take you through some of these examples, uh, some of which you may have seen and maybe some you, you, won't, you won't have seen. Um, for example, in this garbage that I get on my uh, uh, bank statement, uh, are things like the thing on the left, which shows that I've paid an insurer with lots of codes and numbers. And some fintechs have actually developed, uh, this one in particular has developed 4,000 rules to interpret this stuff. So it knows, ah, the 12384 is actually a home insurance, so this guy owns a house. 
and the other one is a, is a, a dog insurance. So he knows he has a dog. And so you can get lots of uh, very interesting insights into somebody just by analyzing how they are insured. And you can, of course, use that to help the customer be insured better by telling him, oh, some of the insurances you have are actually already covered by your credit card, or give him some, um, some hints on where to get a better tariff uh, uh, for, for the insurance cover that he wants. So this is really useful for banks, for insurers, for, for customers. Uh, the other side, of course, of open banking is not only looking at data, but initiating payments. And that's actually not so much in the focus because, of course, the data is the much more valuable part. But there are also some interesting propositions on how to pay better, pay uh, more uh, in recurrent ways uh, in various other things. And depending on your geography, there may be a real need. I, I live in Germany. And uh, on the right, you may see our kitchen table, what it looks like uh, every weekend where my poor wife fills in IBAN numbers uh, because she has to copy them out of the doctor's bills and the kindergarten bills and the tennis club bills onto these forms and send them on uh, um, uh, by, by the post so that the bills are paid. Uh, and there are about uh, 800 million of those which are filled in every year, according to the Bundesbank. So that is obviously a candidate for digitization. And if one looks at the Nordics, you, you don't get these ridiculous uh, paper bills where you, uh, where you fill in uh, IBANs and reference codes. Um, you just get a text message and says, do you want to pay for this uh, therapy for your daughter? And you say yes, uh, and forever don't ask me or, uh, or, or decline for some reason. So there are obviously much better ways of paying, which is the other bit, uh, bit of open banking, uh, which may be useful in some geographies. But uh, more applicable to, to all countries is things like better credit scoring. If one looks at the credit practices of many, uh, many banks, uh, that's what this um, uh, Castlight, for example, Fintech, which was one of the first, uh, said that, that their lending practices have basically changed in 30 years. There's a paper-based process which takes days. They, they consult maybe a credit reference agency and use a sort of traffic light system. And of course, one could do a lot better now. Instead of just looking at your postcode and whether you've maybe not paid a bill in the last five years, you can actually see how is his, uh, how is his performance today? How much uh, uh, net income does he have? How much is available? How much does it vary? How much can he afford to take on? And that means you get much better loans. You don't get so many loan defaults. You also get a few uh, uh, people over overstressing themselves. So they, they've created this thing called an affordability passport to make sure the customers only take on the loans they can really afford. And not only is it when you take on the loan, can you do a better process? It's also after the loan has been granted, where normally nothing happens, but here they continue to monitor your in and out goings and see if there are signs of stress on your account. For example, if you started to cancel Red Cross donations and charity donations, that's a, that's a typical signal that somebody is under stress. So if the customer wants, of course, he has to give consent to all of this, he can get a much better uh, loan, he can get it much better tuned to him, and he will be warned uh, if, if there may be some adjustment that, that is needed. And that's, of course, advantage to banks and to customers. And there are plenty of uh, fintechs in this area who are, who are doing this, for example, Prosper, who um, go through all your accounts, uh, see how much uh, you're paying for your credit cards and your loans, and say, if you were to consolidate all that in one point, you could get a much better rate and just click this optimize button and we'll do it for you and we'll move everything across. So those are some of the consumer things, but what is often forgotten and for some is a bit surprising is the B2B side of open banking. Um, there are some surveys. I would never say that the banks don't meet corporate needs, but there are a survey after survey, which, which does say that the, the, especially the, the SMEs, which is 80% of the market typically, are not really being given the services that they want for invoicing, for cash flow per prediction, uh, for financing. And of course, B2B is actually where the money is. Uh, most of the money is in B2B. And that is why the, the smart fintechs are actually going into the B2B market. Although it's much more sexy to talk about the consumer business and much more directly relatable, uh, uh, the, the actual money and the actual uh, gains and the business cases are in B2B. And so we uh, regularly do analyses of the fintechs in the market, and one can see that the large majority are actually B2B fintechs now. This is not talked about so much in the media. So why is this such a success, and what is the potential? What, what can this develop into? 
Well, in, in my view, this is actually uh, like moving from the old Nokia phone to a smartphone. In the old Nokia phone, you were limited to the functionalities that were provided by Nokia. Whereas with an app store, you can actually get any functionality of anyone who wants to uh, write an app and access a secure interface on a secure system like a phone. And now we are creating an app store on top of banks. The bank is the secure interface. Now we have standardized, inter standardized interfaces, uh, i.e. APIs, and third parties can write applications on top of that. So we're going to see an explosion of creativity on top of banks like we saw an explosion of creativity on top of the phones. And they won't just be about financial services. This was one of the mistakes that was made when the app stores began and when, when open, uh, opening the phone happened. Everybody thought there would be applications only for managing your phone tariff or looking at your phone bill or buying a roaming tariff, all the telecoms thing. But of course, we know now that uh, the phone now does Twitter and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Uber and Skype and Facebook and a million other applications, nothing really to do anymore with telecommunications and buying phone tariffs. And so I think it's safe to predict that when we start putting apps on top of, on top of banks, we will also get services which go way beyond financial services. So what is the next step beyond open banking? Well, we began with things like PSD2. That's what we call it in Europe. And there are other variants, of course, in Singapore and Australia and Asia and Africa. But uh, there's usually a sort of compliance uh, game which, which starts it all off, where you can initiate a payments and look at the data. The next thing is open banking, where we're going to get apps on top of banking, which will uh, widen out uh, to credit and loans and insurance and a few of the and B2B. And I think it's uh, safe to say uh, that this will now expand uh, into all other industries. And the gentleman from IBM before me already alluded to that as well. We're going to get a mashup of other industries like we saw in the African farming example. So we're going to get uh, people connecting across all industries using APIs. And if you look at the latest regulations that are coming out of Europe, you can see this is already being created. A data market is now happening where you connect all industries, not just banks, together using innovative services. And the things we're already seeing in that, uh, that direction are that they go way beyond uh, um, uh, financial services, is that there are some fintechs who, who are helping people stop smoking by looking at their behavior and giving them rewards. Uh, there's even a horoscope uh, fintech who approached us because they just wanted to have a reliable source of the date of birth so they could do the horoscope. Uh, there are many which I don't have time for. I just want to go into one, which is the dating scientist. This is actually uh, an application which won um, uh, uh, um, a hackathon that was recently done. Uh, you, you will all know that uh, uh, online dating is now uh, the most popular way of people meeting each other. It isn't anymore through friends and uh, meeting somebody at a bar or at college or, or wherever. Uh, it, now online, online banking is the number one way in which people meet. Uh, but this uh, dating portal said uh, they have this problem that people lie. They always say their, their age and how much they earn and their hobbies, uh, that it tends to not be the entire truth. And they see a potential for actually using some data, which can be accessed through online banking if you give your consent, to actually bring people together who really do have the same interests and hobbies and maybe compatible in their lifestyles and in their incomes. If they both consent, then you will find somebody who is a dog lover like you, has, likes to travel to Japan like you, uh, likes to go out in the countryside like you. All this data, which can be found, of course, in, uh, on, your, on your banking, on the transactions, on what you really spend on. So this actually won uh, a hackathon recently. It's, for me, one of the surprising things uh, in open banking, which I don't think was intended when the regulator thought of uh, PIS and AIS APIs. And there are plenty more. Uh, identity, I think, is going to be another huge one. The way we do identity now, of course, is an absolute disaster. When we, we let uh, children and people go into very dubious uh, sites or buy alcohol just by clicking a yes button, uh, when I want to look at my uh, BBC iPlayer, it just asks me, have you got a TV license? I just click on that. And of course, by looking at my uh, statement, one can see whether I've really paid for the BBC license. I don't have a ridiculous pop-up button. Even my Scrabble app asks me for my age for some reason. So all these things can be automated and made much more reliable, and we get proper identity at last. 
So how are banks preparing for this? Well, the smart ones are saying, I'm not just going to do the basic APIs required by the regulator. I'm actually going to do a whole suite of APIs for all things so that I can be embedded in farming apps, in dating apps, in lending apps, in car sharing apps, in bicycle apps, in, in house purchasing apps, so they can be everywhere. And here are some of the examples of what we're seeing. Um, you want uh, not only basic uh, uh, payment uh, APIs, you want uh, all sorts of different flavors. For example, Netflix wants uh, a payment every month, but not the first month because that's free. So how about having an API for things like uh, such subscription services? Um, then there are the categorized clean data. So you don't get the garbage which you pass one to one onto the fintech. You actually clean it and verify it and structure it and put in the currencies, put in something that is uh, much more easily interpretable. Then the whole of the corporate services I mentioned, the, the, uh, the identity things like verifying your name, your age, your, your shipping address is a hugely valuable API for merchants, whether you've really paid your TV license. Uh, all these things. So there's a whole host of APIs which banks can and should, in my view, uh, be publishing uh, so as to make sure they're in the center of this service. And of course, uh, only the compliance ones are chargeable, uh, are free, so all these other ones are chargeable. So there's even a, a very sh short term business there. So what is this API mashup economy that I've tried to uh, describe very briefly as, as a sort of perspective on here? Well, I think it's already happening. If you uh, look at uh, the services that we see today, the, the Revoluts and the Facebooks and, the, and, and, and WeChats and Tinder and whatever, they are basically mashing up uh, data from APIs from different services and different providers. For example, Uber takes your location from your phone, takes the driver's location from his phone, takes the maps from Google, and takes a payment API from a bank. And it mashes those four industries up together to provide a new service called Uber. And that, I think, is typical of what we're doing nowadays. We're just mashing up flight data, uh, payment data, map data, location data, IoT data, car data to provide new services. This is the new game that everybody's playing. And again, we're going to see some sort of surprises. These are the things we see now. And here's an example of a, of a surprise in that area. You can buy commercially a toaster which will toast the weather for you on your bread for breakfast. And it does this by accessing your calendar and seeing uh, uh, today you're going to be in Singapore and uh, accessing a, a weather a API and says, ah, it's going to be raining. And then it can toast the weather uh, for your business trip today on your toast in the morning. And of course, using open banking, it'll even be able to toast your bank balance for you in the morning, should you want to see that. I'm showing that to you not as an example of what's probably going to be the, the biggest uh, business killer, uh, the, the killer application, but just to show that everything will go in very surprising ways. We've seen that on the iPhone. We've seen that in, uh, in all sorts of other ways. Whenever systems were opened up, the creativity will be unleashed in extraordinary ways. And I think that's going to be the fun of this. So I'm at the end. I hope I've made a quick tour de force of what uh, open banking uh, currently means, what surprising things will happen along the way, from dating to B2B to, to identity. Uh, and the fintechs will play a huge role because they are the fast, clever ones who understand consumers and, uh, and identify new things, just like the app developers. The banks uh, will not be replaced by fintechs. That's a ridiculous proposition. The banks are needed for the solidity, for the reliability. They have access to all the customers, which the fintechs don't. They know very good at compliance. They're very good at security. Um, they have the funds. Um, so those two need to work together. And we're starting to connect to other industries as well, the telcos and the maps and the, uh, and the uh, drivers and the IoT. And then there are various service providers which are needed to tie the bits together. together. And if we get this right, we're all going to be winners, right? We're going to get new services as customers. These new incumbents can all become millionaires with their fantastic uh, fintechs. And uh, Europe and the world will benefit. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Michael. That's, um... A lot of great insights there. I guess um, I have I have a few questions based on that, um, based on the uh, the saying the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. So you've given a picture of some things, uh, particularly from from other industries, but also what has uh, what has happened uh, uh, after the, the the regulators in in Europe required banks to to open APIs. Um, 
the mashup economy uh, that you describe um, creates all sorts of possibilities, but it also creates some some risks because banks are not just um, partnering with other financial institutions or fintechs, but they're partnering with uh, other firms or they're, use, they're consuming services um, that are based on the weather API or some other type of API. And then they, they need to start to consider, well, a large part of this value proposition of, of this mashup is provided by other people. And how do I, uh, how do I manage that, that risk if that service goes down? How do, how do I build resiliency? Because they've, they've been told by the regulators you need, to, you need to have a certain level of uptime, you need to have a, a certain quality of service. What, what do you see as the mechanisms for um, building that, that sort of resilience when, when a lot of things, when a lot of new services are mashups of, uh, of, of a lot of other things? Hmm. No, I mean, that's, uh, that's certainly true that the world's got more complex uh, through this, right? So in the past, everything was in the, in the bank's hands and they, they controlled everything. And now there are a few other partners on the way to, to the customer. But that's actually been the case for, for a number of years, right? I mean, even with online banking, right? You, the, between you and your bank, there is a computer, there's a browser, there are various chips, there's a telecommunications link, uh, there are all the software providers along the chain. So banks have got really good at managing these, these complex uh, uh, ecosystem. It's getting a bit more complex because there are yet more partners. But I, the, the point I'm, I was trying to make is this, this is also an opportunity. For example, they don't need to do everything themselves anymore. There was a time when banks always got a lot of flack when, why haven't you integrated my Fitbit and uh, why can't I see my balance on my latest wearable and why isn't it in my uh, this and that? Now they just say, um, uh, get a fintech to do it. They don't need to cover every single base themselves now. So I think they're very good at, uh, uh, at managing these systems. It's not going to get any easier, that's for sure. But uh, once the consent mechanisms are in there, the technical and the governance mechanisms are in there, I, I have no doubt at all that the banks can manage it and they've shown they can do it. As I say, in Germany and in, uh, in, in America, some of these things have been going for 20 years and the world hasn't collapsed, on the contrary. Well, thanks. Uh, th that's, um, that's a great, great response to, to this sort of open, open question. And I guess a lot of institutions are probably thinking that. Um, you know how how do I how do I manage that risk and and pointing to how um, the managed uh, telephone banking and internet banking and uh, all those other things is uh, mm. is a is a great great message there. All right. Mm. Well. Well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Michael, for your perspective. My pleasure. Thank you.